Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy, and the starting point for this materials unit is to introduce some of the material properties of different engineering materials. Now we're going to split these into four categories. We're going to look at mechanical properties, we're going to look at physical properties, thermal properties, and finally electrical and magnetic properties. Now you will have seen some of these before, we're just going to run through these for clarification before we begin to look at the classifications of different engineering materials. So let's begin with our mechanical properties. And the seven mechanical properties that we're going to look at are elasticity, malleability, ductility, tensile and compressive strength, hardness, toughness, and brittleness. So we'll take each one of these in turn and we'll clarify what each of these different material properties are. So we've already come across the idea of elasticity and plasticity. We said that elasticity was when a material stretches or changes shape, but then returns to its original size and shape when that force is removed. The way that differed from plasticity was plasticity was when a material deformed under a force, and when that force was removed, it remained constantly deformed. So the difference between elasticity and plasticity is that elasticity is temporary deformation, and plasticity is permanent deformation. So when we talk about the elasticity of a material, what we're talking about is how readily it deforms and then returns to its original shape. So the simplest way to think of this is placing a piece of material under a tensile load. If that piece of material has high elasticity, then it's going to stretch. But the important thing here is that when it stretches and when that force is removed, that piece of material must return to its original length. Now different materials will have different levels of elasticity. Some will stretch readily under a load and others will be very resistant to stretching. The opposite of elasticity is called stiffness. So elastic materials stretch and return. Stiff materials are very resistant to stretching or elastic deformation. Now where that differs from malleability and ductility is that malleability and ductility are plastic deformations. So these are materials that when they deform, they don't return to their original size or shape. If we take malleability first of all, when we talk about malleability, we're referring to deformation under compressive stresses. So we could have a piece of material and we might choose to exert a force on that piece of material. Now that could be an impact force or it could be a static force, but what the malleable material will do is it will deform under that load. So we might end up with something more like this. The important thing here is that once that load is removed, the piece of material doesn't return to its original shape. Now ductility is very similar. It's still a plastic or a permanent deformation, but it's a permanent deformation under a tensile force. So once again, we have a tensile force being applied to a piece of material. What the ductile material will do is it will stretch. In doing so, it will actually also become more narrow. But ductility is the ability of a material to stretch permanently under a tensile force. You may also see ductility referred to as the ability to be drawn into wire. So if we have a material that we want to draw into a wire, such as copper wire, then we would need the copper or the material that's being used to have high ductility in order for that to happen. So next we have our tensile and compressive strengths. If we take our piece of material again and we place it under a tensile load, then strength refers to how much force or how much stress that piece of material can resist before it fails. So something with high tensile strength can take a very large force before it fails and before it ruptures. This is all about the amount of force required to make the piece of material fail. Whereas a material with low strength would only require a relatively small force before it ruptured. Compressive strength is very similar, except there we're referring to a force in the compressive direction. So we might have a pillar supporting the weight of a ceiling or something similar, and that would need a high compressive strength because the forces would be trying to compress that piece of material. Next we have hardness, and the hardness of a material relates to its resistance to scratching and indentation. So if we have a piece of material, what we're really looking at here is the surface of the material. And if that material is hard, 
then it will be resistant to scratching and indentation. And if that material is soft, it will be more easy to scratch and indent. One of the tests they use for this is they place a ball bearing of a known size on a piece of material and then they apply a known load or a known force to that ball bearing. And what they're looking at is the indentation that's left after that test has been carried out. The hard material will leave a relatively small indentation with the same force and the same size ball bearing, whereas the soft material would leave a much larger indentation. But that also applies to scratching of the surface. And finally, we have toughness and brittleness. Now, toughness and brittleness are the opposites of each other. If we have a piece of material that's tough, and this also relates to malleability, as you'll see in a moment. So let's assume that this piece of material is tough and we decide to apply an impact force to it. That tough material will absorb that impact force. Now we're not saying that that material won't deform. We can see here that our piece of material is deformed, but it hasn't ruptured. It hasn't fractured here under the impact force. So tough materials can absorb a lot of impact force or impact energy without rupture. Brittle materials, on the other hand, if we think of a sheet of glass, which is known to be very brittle, then any impact force applied to that glass is going to cause the glass to fracture or rupture because it has low toughness or high brittleness. So next we have our physical properties. We have density and melting point. Now we've already mentioned density in previous tutorials and we talked about how the density of a material is described as its mass per unit volume. So we could have two materials that are both the same size. Let's say for argument's sake that both of these materials are one meter cubed. We have two different materials and both of these materials are one meter cubed. The material with high density will be heavier than the material with low density. If you Google the property of density, Quite often it will talk about how compact the particles are and what we'll see in later tutorials is that dense materials have very closely packed atoms, so this is our high density material, whereas lower density materials have much less closely packed atoms. And melting point or melting temperature as it's also referred to is the physical temperature that causes these materials to melt. If we think of ice as a prime example, we know that ice melts at zero degrees C. Whereas if we take things such as common metals, then we could be talking temperatures in the high hundreds or even the low thousands of degrees Celsius in order to cause those materials to melt. So moving on then to thermal properties, we have three of interest here. We have thermal conductivity, thermal expansivity, and specific heat capacity. Now, when we talk about thermal conductivity, we often also refer to thermal resistivity. And resistivity refers to resistance, whereas conductivity relates to allowing heat to conduct. They're actually the inverses of each other. Now, the example that I like to give for this is, imagine you have a piece of copper. And you're going to hold the left hand end of the copper, and you're going to place the right hand end in a fire or a flame. Thermal conductivity relates to how quickly or how readily that heat energy is going to transfer through that piece of material. Materials with high thermal conductivity mean that that heat's going to travel very quickly. And materials with low thermal conductivity means that that heat is going to travel much slower. If we think of that in terms of thermal resistivity, if the heat travels quickly, then the material isn't very resistant to the transfer of heat. If that heat travels slowly, then the material has high thermal resistivity. Next then we have thermal expansivity. And when we talk about expansivity, we're talking about expansion. So something with high thermal expansivity is going to expand a lot as it heats, and something with low thermal expansivity isn't going to expand as much. So let's take a piece of material. And let's apply heat to that piece of material. Now when we heat materials, they expand. So what we would expect is this piece of material is going to become longer. But please don't also forget that that piece of material 
is going to become wider as well. Its change in width is going to be significantly less because of the width in comparison to the length, but nonetheless, its width is going to change. Now, finally, for our thermal properties, we have specific heat capacity. And specific heat capacity is about the amount of energy required to heat a piece of material. So we could have two identical pieces of material, and we might want to heat both of those from room temperature. So let's say 20 degrees C, and we might want to heat them until they reach 50 degrees C. Now, because they're two different materials, and because they have different specific heat capacities, the amount of energy, the amount of heat energy required in order to achieve that is going to be different. The important thing here is what we're inputting is heat energy. And what we're inputting here is heat energy. So if we think of a kettle as an example, the element inside the kettle is providing the heat energy. If we was to fill that kettle with water, then the amount of energy required to heat that water would be different to if we was heating oil as an example. Now finally we have our electrical and magnetic properties and first of all we have electrical conductivity and electrical resistivity. So much like thermal conductivity and thermal resistivity, electrical conductivity and resistivity are the inverses of each other. And what we're referring to here is how readily they pass electricity. So if we can imagine if we're putting electrons in the left hand side of this piece of material, if it's electrically conductive, then we'll receive electrons out the other side. And in actual fact, it relates more to the amount of energy or the amount of potential difference in order to move those electrons. Something with good electrical conductivity will allow those electrons to pass with relatively little energy. And if they're electrically resistive or have high electrical resistivity, then they're almost going to provide a barrier preventing electricity to pass. Incidentally, materials that resist electrical current and resist heat are called insulators. So next we have permittivity. Permittivity is really about how readily a material allows an electric field to be set up. So the simplest way to think of this is if we have a positive charge or a positively charged particle, and if we have a negatively charged particle, then an electric field is going to exist between those two particles because they're going to want to attract each other. Now, if we take a vacuum as an example, a vacuum has a low permittivity, meaning it will allow the setting up of that electric field. But if we replace that material with something with a higher permittivity, then what that's basically going to do is try to block or prevent the formation of that electric field. So some materials permit the electric field to be set up, having a low permittivity. And some of them try to prevent the setting up of the electric field, therefore having high permittivity. Now our final material property is magnetic permeability. And magnetic permeability is how readily a material can become magnetised. If we think of an electromagnet as an example, a typical electromagnet will be made up of a core, quite often iron, and around that core we have an electromagnet, like so. Now when we apply an electric current through the coil, it becomes magnetised. If we choose a material with a high magnetic permeability for our core, so for example iron has a high magnetic permeability, then what will happen is that will strengthen our magnet. So this magnet is going to end up with a north and south pole with or without the core, but if we choose a material with a high permeability, then the strength of that magnet is going to increase because the core in the middle becomes magnetised. Therefore, a material with a low magnetic permeability is going to be resistant to becoming magnetised. So in this video, we've introduced four different types of properties, mechanical properties, physical properties, thermal properties, and electrical and magnetic properties. And what we're going to do in subsequent videos is look at how the structure of different engineering materials actually affects some of these properties.